Hello everybody and welcome to part one of How to Write Like James Joyce. Today we're going to be talking about his free and indirect speech style, or free indirect style, free indirect discourse. There's a few different names for it. You can look it up in Google if you want to know more about it and the variations of its names. But basically, James Joyce used it in Ulysses and a bunch of other of his other works, The Portrait of the Young Man as an Artist, um, Dubl Dubliners. And uh, it was pioneered by Jane Austen, is considered like the first good example of it being used, or someone who used it widely, and that it became known, uh, be kind of really like pioneered the whole technique. So uh, first, before we kind of like jump into the examples I have, it's useful to know, have a comparison of what we're talking to, uh, talking about rather, like the different styles of narration and like the different way ways you can frame it. And you already have an understanding of like, what direct speech is and like the other forms, but it'll be easier to break it down. So let me show you some different examples of what you're already familiar with, and then we'll jump into how James Joyce utilizes free and direct speech in Ulysses in particular. And I've picked out a few of my favorite passages where he uh, exemplifies it the best. So here, just very quickly, I ripped this offline, just so very quickly to give you a rundown of the, com just so you have a framework to understand what free indirect speech style of narration means even. Is so if you look here at the top example, quoted or direct speech, which is probably something everybody's very familiar with, is he laid down his bundle and thought of his misfortune. And then within quotations, and just what pleasure have I found since I came into this world, he asked. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. That's how probably nine out of ten people would write it. And the other one percent other ten percent would write it this way, reported or normal indirect speech. He laid down his bundle and thought of his misfortune. He asked himself what pleasure he had found since he came into this world. Notice, far more passive, thus the indirect portion of the, the style there. And then we have free and indirect speech, which is the style we're going to be talking about today. He laid down his bundle and thought of his misfortune, and just what pleasure had he found since he came into this world. Notice it's not within quotations, and it's not set off by he asked, she asked, said, laughed, the sort of thing. Those are um, removed. That is something that's characteristic of the style, is that you don't have all of these... Uh, like speeches, like uh, nothing setting off the dialogue or what would have been dialogue in the direct speech style. So therefore, it's not even it's not even speech. And some people uh, would call this instead of free indirect speech style or discourse because of that. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of context what we're talking about. But really, what it is merging of first person and third person styles of narration. So you're you're kind of you're narrating through the character in some sense versus or the character speaking through the narrator so it's this very um hybrid sort of first and third person being merged and kind of made it it's like very difficult to really like pinpoint the kind of two different those two different essential um perspectives within them but once you start to see it being used you start to have an eye for it and it becomes very easy to identify and uh practice and use if in your own writing so let's switch back to the examples we have for Joyce here. So here we have three examples from Ulysses. Before I give you like any background on Ulysses and like some of the story of, of whatnot of what's happening, let's just look at what he's doing with the words and the actual syntax uh, to kind of give you an idea of what's characteristic of free and direct speech and like why it's good and why someone may want to use it. Um, Joyce is obviously very well known for developing stream of consciousness, quote unquote, as every writer in the world now likes to say is the way they draft. <laughs> it's like a running joke at writing conferences that everybody writes stream of consciousness and everybody thinks they got that from Joyce. We'll get into that in a little bit later. But here, let's look at this first example. We'll just read through it. A dwarf's face, mauve and wrinkled like little Rudy's was. Dwarf's body, weak as putty, in a white line deal box. Burial friendly society pays. Penny a week for a sod of turf. Our little beggar baby meant nothing. Mistake of nature. If it's healthy, it's from the mother. If not, the man. Better luck next time. Wow. So first off, you can already tell in the reading, that's a very unique reading like the, of just going through prose. And you'll notice within here, fragment, consider revising. Joyce uses a great deal of sentence fragments, fra excuse me, sentence fragments within this style. Because if you think about it, in, in Ulysses, a lot of what he was trying to do in the narration of it is quote-unquote stream of consciousness, what does that actually mean? It means he's trying to give you the thoughts. The narration is running through the filter of a human being's thoughts. So now if you just reflect on the way we think, it's pretty psychotic and very fragmented. Like we don't, it's very rare that we are very um, streamlined on one thought and it makes a logical progression 
throughout our lives or our day that we're thinking about things. Usually it's, you know, you're at work and you're focused on a task, but then you remember that somebody died yesterday and that makes you sad. And like all of a sudden it's horribly chaotic the way we think it makes no sense to us. And thank God no one else can hear it. But in our minds, they're so frantic and there's so much input that we have to deal with at any given time that they are just, there's just an overwhelming abundance of input, whether it's descriptions or thoughts or emotions or whatever it is. So that's, why he is so famous and why Ulysses is considered maybe one of the greatest novels ever written is because he, uh, for better or for worse, really demonstrated um, what human beings' thoughts are like, in, in a sense. Like, he really put it into prose and into a story. So, and the effect of that, and that's why we have these sentence fragments, is, and it, he's thinking, it's just natural to the way we think, though. Burial-friendly, society pays. Penny a week for a sod of turf. So, He's now, what's actually being talked about is that Bloom. Bloom is a character in the story. Um, there's really two main characters, Stephen Daedalus and Leopold Bloom. And they're on the way to a burial. Uh, someone died. Patty Dignam died. And you'll, we'll see about him. We'll hear more about him in a minute. But he died, and they're in a carriage going to this funeral with the body. It's, uh, I believe the body's actually in the carriage or on top of the carriage. The body is nearby anyway. And... Um, He's just thinking, as he's in this carriage riding to this funeral, he's thinking about uh, this baby that died. I think his, what it seems to be reflecting is that his wife had a miscarriage, right? Uh, a dwarf's face, so infants have this like awkward, like alien-looking face most of the time when they're freshly born. Dwarf's body, weak as putty, again, describing an infant in a white line deal box, again, in the hospital, like in the boxes they put little babies in, or the uh, cradles, whatever you'd like to call them. And again, you have to keep in mind, this is written a long time ago, so the, the, the words are different. Like, the way it's described is not period to now. But, burial friendly, so the baby died. Penny a week for a sod of turf. That's how much it costs for the plot of land, I suppose, to bury it. Uh, although I don't understand... Again, now, there is an element of confusion, especially... A lot of this has to do with the distance of time and the fact that it was written in, like, a different part of the world, too. They might have different different cultures. But, um, I don't know, do you rent Penny a week for a sod of turf? I'm not even clear. Like, did they rent it, or... You, uh, you paid, like, it in installments. Like, every week you had to pay a penny for the to pay off the side of turf. Hard to, hard to say for sure. Our little beggar baby meant nothing. Mistake of nature. So if she miscarried or if it was, you know, born unhealthy, it didn't obviously didn't live. And then he's remarking. Notice, now, this is kind of, like, where the punches. Where, so this is the, this is the interesting part of free and indirect speech. So if it's healthy, it's from the mother. If not, the man. Better luck next time. Who's saying that? Is Bloom saying it? Or is Joyce saying it? Is it the narrator or the character? Ah, herein lies the genius of free and direct speech. It's impossible to say. It's both. Both or none or either or. Um, that's really kind of the genius of it because you can't attribute it to either one, but it comes across so naturally that you've, you're running through this memory of, of Bloom's that you would believe it, it would kind of intuitively come to you as Bloom's, but it's also a way for an author to inject their own narration seamlessly through the character. Now you start to see the genius of it. If you're now all of a sudden as the narrator able to inject the, the prose through the character, so it's almost no longer narration, all of a sudden you have a really immersive experience, thus the genius of Ulysses. And he used this a great deal throughout Ulysses, particularly in the portions with Leopold Bloom, not so much with Stephen Daedalus, almost almost none with Daedalus, Stephen any, anyways. Let's go on to this next example, we'll keep it moving. That afternoon of the inquest, the red labeled bottle on the bottle on the excuse me, the red labeled bottle on the table. The room in the hotel with hunting pictures, stuffy it was. Sunlight through the slats of the Venetian blinds, the coroner's ears, big and hairy, boots giving evidence, thought he was asleep first, then saw like yellow streaks on his face, had slipped down to the foot of the bed. Verdict? Overdose. Death by misadventure. The letter? For my son, Leopold. The letter? For my son, Leopold. And again, this is again still on the way to that funeral, and he's remembering, it seems like his father dying, because obviously his son, Leopold, Bloom's the one narrating, or this is the from being told by him. So it seems, and so this is when his father died. So his baby died. He's remembering people that have died. This baby, this baby that died, this miscarriage, his father that died. Um, and again, the sentence fragments are huge. Look how all of this, all of this is fragments. And again, it's because our, our thoughts, like you do, our, our thoughts are not neat like that. We don't say, he said, he died. We don't think in this very dis disconnected third person style. And it's not quite 
it's formal as first person uh, in some sense. So, but when you blend the two, you get something that's rather accurate to the way we think. And again, you like when you think of he's thinking of his father died, had slipped down to the foot of the bed. Verdict: overdose, death by misadventure. The letter from my son Leopold. By the way, this line, "death by misadventure," is fucking great. Like I, I that's part of the why, reason I denoted this passage, like verdict. And I love the colon usage. Like so much of this is improper. I'm, another video will be about how uh, Joyce broke the rules. And, like, why people should hate him, why academics should hate him. It's interesting that academics like him because he broke all of the rules. Like, like usually Collins is used to denote a list. He didn't do it like that. Like, he really bent things. And there's even better examples, which I'm saving for another video of. Like, really, James Joyce did not give a damn about the rules. He simply just wrote it exactly the way he wanted. And it came across a genius. And although he's using sentence fragments and although he's using Collins and, like, in... in improper quote-unquote ways or unconventional ways it works so well um i mean look at it look at the reputation and the career he had and like the things he wrote it's amazing so thinking about this more macro the way he uses free and direct speech where he broke all these rules he's using sentence fragments he's not denoting things he's not saying things off with quotes um there's no he said she said going on whatsoever so there is a danger inherent within free and direct speech in that it's very confusing it can be anyway depending on how it's executed um, Ulysses is a notoriously difficult read. I can't tell you how many people I've mentioned it to or it's, it's come up in conversation and how many people tried to pick it up because they heard it was so amazing and couldn't finish it. Couldn't even finish a chapter, honestly. This book <laughs> is honestly one of the most confusing things I've ever read. And anybody who read it and said it just made perfect sense off the bat is so full of shit. I can't even begin to tell you. Um, it is, it is a whirlwind of prose. Now, he was a genius. Like, I appreciate Joyce in so many ways. I'm not a fan of him in a sense that it's very... It, he kind of lost himself in it. And there's, it's remarked that Joyce, in some sense, was trying to outwit language, which is a really bizarre idea for a writer to try and outwit language. And you can truly, you really get that sense in the fact that sometimes it works beautifully. Like, those, those passages I've showed you with Bloom. Uh, Bloom was the saving grace of the story. Stephen Daedalus was... Uh, almost ruined it <laughs> and it's supposed to be Joyce's when he was a younger man he's also featured in the portrait of the art artist's young man um, there's a letters from Hemingway talking about Ulysses though and he recommends it as like required reading or like something everybody should read but he remarked to Joyce or in a letter that uh, Stephen Daedalus almost killed Ulysses and it's true like Stephen Daedalus almost ruined this entire story it was so he, those portions are so bad and um, some academics like try to explain it away and like there's some like, th there's some very, like, deep meta-academic people that, like, thought those parts were good and they just simply weren't. Like, they, they're they unintelligible now. So, I don't know what they meant back then, like, when the book was current, when it came out in, like, uh, 1920s, I think, 1930s, early 1900s. Um, I don't know if it made sense then, but it certainly doesn't make sense now. It's like almost reading another language, those portions, because he's referencing... Things that were periods of the time and the vocabulary, it's so archaic and it's so flowery. The prose is super purple there. Like, and it doesn't even make sense. It's so, it's very, that's part, it's almost unintelligible now. But then he has these huge flashes of genius with with Bloom. Like the, there's a firework scene that's very famous where um, Bloom's having this like fantasy with this young girl who you end up finding is like crippled, super interesting turn of events and he has this comment with a bat it's super good there are some moments of blistering genius within ulysses and joyce was obviously capable of it and he was a psychopath for doing this um it's largely remarked that the book in some ways it's a parody of the odyssey thus the name ulysses and in some sense he was trying to say that the day-to-day -day occurrences everybody goes through of um, going to a bar, seeing people you know, walking around this town, getting drunk, like these super, like meaningless seeming things um, are actually of great importance, that the, the small things matter in some sense, that like the days we forget are somehow of great, are actually meaningful in some sense. Um, but then again, so that's like kind of the romantic sort of like good description of what he was trying to accomplish with Ulysses. And then the, on the other hand, he was quoted as saying that there's not a serious word in it, that like the whole book's in some sense a big joke. Super interesting, they spent six years writing a big joke, and then he was so exhausted after finishing it, he quit writing for a year entirely. Um, but you get the sense that he is parodying um, 
the the Odyssey, not in a direct way. Like if you no one told you that, you would have no clue he's doing it. Um, other than maybe the title, I suppose. But you get to see how there is this kind of joke of like Odysseus is obviously like fighting, going through Scylla and Charybdis and the Cyclops, and um, trying to get home and all these the million things that happened to him on the Odyssey. And then to say that Bloom and or Stephen Daedalus and Bloom walking around their town getting drunk and like not being able to get money and I don't know and just their wives and girlfriends and the family all this stuff that's kind of in the back of their heads is somehow comparable is laughable in some sense. But then again, look, he makes this tremendous work out of it and pioneers an entire style called quote unquote stream of consciousness. I would like to make that a very clear distinction just for like new writers or people that don't understand what stream of consciousness is. Stream of consciousness in the way that Joyce used it is not just sitting at your keyboard and rattling away the first garbage that comes to your head and not being able to say no to your keyboard. Um, that's not what stream of consciousness is. Never has been. People like say like now rock like some lyrics are stream of consciousness. It's all garbage. Uh, it's not true. Like real stream of consciousness. Like what I just showed you. That was a great example of stream of consciousness. Is that free and direct speech style where you're blurring the lines between first and third person into this hybrid, and you're actually being very like James Joyce just didn't sit down and like free write that. <laughs> Think of like he sat there very consciously and analyzed the way he thinks and took note of it and then implemented it into the prose and for the purpose of the story obviously it was a very deliberate act of him using that style to tell the story it wasn't him free writing the first thousand words that came to ha came to his mind while he's working on the story i think that's a huge misconception because you just word vomit onto a page doesn't make your stuff stream of consciousness. I, it's such a huge misconception. It's like embarrassing to hear people say that's how they describe their writing style. It's fine if you free write and it's fine if you like word vomit onto pages and then you, you know, edit it and revise it into something good. But that's not what Joyce did. Uh, not like not not what his style was de like defining of in any sense. Like not to say I'm sure the guy free wrote and like obviously, but that is not an accurate description of his style or like the tools that he used. And now obviously I could go on and on forever. There's enough stuff in Ulysses. I could probably dedicate an entire YouTube channel for the rest of my life and never finish all the million of other things going on in the story. Like the fact that he was parodying not only the Odyssey, but also like contemporary writers throughout all time. He was like insulting their style or not insulting, but he was just it's a parody like he was entertaining people he was like playing off their style and kind of like making fun of it in a sense and he like with like dozens if not hundreds of different writers um it's like a tremendous he joyce was quoted as saying that he put enough puzzles in ulysses to keep professors studying it for the rest of, like for the rest of their lives and that they'll never figure it out and that they'll never finish it so that's the kind of guy joyce was <laughs> so until next time guys stay tuned for a part two peace out